When parents send their children off to school, they not only need faith that the institution will provide them with a good education, but that they'll keep them safe. After all, they are entrusting these schools to watch over their child for several hours per day. Unfortunately, however, sometimes parents will send their child off to school and wind up never seeing them again. Today, we are looking at five cases of students vanishing from their schools part 2. I apologize that it took so long to get this video out and that it is done with the text-to-speech program again. But there has been way too many people in my house for the last week and I was not able to record, so this is the next best thing. 17-year-old Missouri girl Kara Kapetsky attended Belton High School on May 4, 2007 and, sometime during the morning, had an argument with one of her teachers. Out of frustration, Kara apparently decided she was going to ditch school for the rest of the day. Surveillance footage captured her walking out of the building at approximately 10.30 a.m., but no knows what happened to her next. When Kara didn't return home or show up for a 4 p.m. shift at Popeye's Chicken, her family filed a missing persons report. Since Kara had a history of running away, authorities initially believed she may have done so again. However, she left all her personal belongings behind, kept her cell phone turned off, and has not accessed her bank account since she disappeared. One possible suspect was Kyra's ex-boyfriend, Kyle Yust, against whom she had recently filed an order of protection. Kyle had allegedly been stalking and threatening Kara and her last call from her cell phone that morning was to his voicemail. However, Kyle was cooperative with the investigation and seemed to have an alibi for the time Kara went missing. About two weeks after she disappeared, there was a reported sighting of Kara with an unidentified man in Lewisburg, Kansas, but authorities have been unable to determine if it was actually her. No one knows where Kara Kapetsky was heading when she exited her school, but she remains missing six years later. Kara Kapetsky update jurors returned guilty verdicts Thursday night against a man accused of killing two Kansas City area women, who disappeared ten years apart. Kyle Yust was found guilty of voluntary manslaughter for the death of Kara Kapetsky, and second-degree murder in the death of Jessica Runians. Kapetsky, 17, of Belton, filed a protection order against Yust in April 2007 a month before she went missing after walking out of Belton High School. Runians, 21, of Raymore, was seen leaving a gathering with Yust before she disappeared in September 2016. A man hunting mushrooms found their bodies in April 2017 in a rural area near Belton. The jury deliberated 15 hours over two days before reaching their decision. Sentencing proceedings begin at 8.30 a.m. Friday, April 16, 2021. On the morning of May 3, 2002, seven-year-old Alexis Patterson walked with her stepfather to High Mount Boulevard School in Milwaukee. When Alexis arrived at school, she was last seen heading toward the playground before her stepfather went home. However, she never attended any of her classes, though other students reported seeing her crying on the playground both before and after school that day. However, these are the last confirmed sightings of Alexis and the school did not notify her family about her absence until that afternoon. An extensive search of the area failed to turn up any trace of her. Alexis had a perfect attendance record prior to her disappearance and it was theorized she chose not to attend classes after getting into an argument with her mother the night before. As punishment, Alexis was not allowed to bring cupcakes to her classmates as she had originally promised, which might explain why she didn't show up for class, but was still seen hanging around the school playground. Some students reported seeing a suspicious red truck parked near the school during the preceding week, which was never seen again after Alexis' disappearance. Months later, an anonymous caller contacted a Milwaukee television station to claim that Alexis' remains could be found in the Milwaukee River, but a search turned up nothing and the identity of the caller is unknown. Over a decade later, Alexis Patterson has still never been found. 
On October 25, 1978, six-year-old Carrie Seg was enjoying lunchtime recess at Albert Einstein Hebrew Day School in Las Vegas when he suddenly went missing. According to classmates, Carrie had entered a vehicle which pulled onto school property. Later that day, Carrie's parents received a ransom call demanding $500,000 for their son's return. The caller claimed he would contact the Seox in two days to provide instructions about how to deliver the money, but they never heard from him again. Suspicion quickly turned towards Jerry Burgess, a former employee of Carrie's father. Burgess had sexually assaulted a woman at Carrie's school the week before his disappearance and was identified as the driver of the vehicle. When the SEGs received the ransom call, the phone was initially answered by one of their neighbors, who recognized Burgess' voice. Burgess would eventually lead authorities to one of Carrie's shoes on a nearby road, but claimed he only knew this information because he was acting as a go-between for the Seg family and the kidnappers. Burgess was charged with Carrie's kidnapping in 1982, but was ultimately acquitted. When he was arrested for another crime in 2000, Burgess was reportedly heard mentioning that he had disposed of Carrie's body by welding his remains inside a steel drum. Burgess also happened to have rented some welding equipment in the days prior to Carrie's disappearance. However, Burgess has always maintained his innocence and it's believed that others may have been involved in the kidnapping. After nearly 35 years, Carrie Seg's disappearance is still unsolved. 15-year-old Utah sophomore Kiplan Davis was experiencing a typical school morning at Spanish Fork High School on May 2, 1995. However, after having lunch with her friends at the cafeteria, Kiplan did not show up for the rest of her classes that day. She never returned home and left all her personal belongings behind in her locker. When Kiplan's parents reported her missing, Authorities assumed she was a runaway since she had gotten into an argument with her family that morning. The Davis family would have to wait an entire decade before they received any answers. In 2005, five men, four of whom were students at Kiplan's school at the time she vanished, were indicted for perjury. It was believed that two of these students, David Rakulfson and Timmy Brent Olson, were responsible for raping and murdering Kiplin and that the others conspired to manufacture an alibi for them. The five men all claimed they had been hanging lights in the school auditorium at the time Kiplin disappeared. However, this story was discounted by a community choir, who were performing in the auditorium that day and did not see any of the men there. Olsen was eventually charged with first-degree murder, but in 2011, he decided to plead guilty to first-degree manslaughter in exchange for a reduced sentence. He claimed to have witnessed another man hit Kiplin with a rock before helping him dispose of her body. However, Olsen has refused to name his accomplice or the location of Kiplin's body, so she is still officially a missing person. Timmy Brent Olsen has pleaded guilty to manslaughter in the 1995 disappearance of Kiplin Davis, saying he was present when someone else killed the 15-year-old girl. Olsen pleaded guilty Friday morning to a second-degree felony charge of manslaughter. He was sentenced to up to 15 years in prison, to be served concurrently with the federal perjury sentence he is currently serving. Davis disappeared from Spanish Fork High School on May 2, 1995. The Davis family is relieved by Olson's plea. Davis's further Richard said that hearing someone finally take responsibility for his daughter's death was a huge victory and something the family had been wanting for years. It's like somebody taking a big load off of us, he said. It was just like a heavy load was lifted off our shoulders. Attorney Marianne O'Brien said prosecutors agreed to the plea deal because they were facing a difficult case in which they still have not located Davis's body. O'Brien added that she hoped the resolution would bring some closure to Davis's family. On the morning of June 4, 2010, Terry Moulton Horman took her seven-year-old stepson, Kyron, to Skyline Elementary School in Portland, Oregon. They arrived sometime after 8 a.m. and Terry stayed around to help Kyron set up an exhibit for a science fair. Terry claims that after the bell rang at 8.45, 
Chiron walked toward his class as she left the school. When Chiron failed to arrive home after school later that afternoon, Terry reported him missing, but an extensive search failed to turn up anything. Chiron never showed up for any of his classes and, though a witness reported seeing him and Terry setting up their exhibit at around 8.15, there were no other confirmed sightings of Chiron at the school that day. However, suspicion started to fall upon Terry once authorities discovered that her cell phone records did not seem to match her reported movements that day. A landscaper soon came forward to claim that, months beforehand, Terry offered him money to kill her husband. Authorities had the landscaper wear a wire in an attempted sting operation on Terry, but she failed to say anything incriminating. In light of this information, Terry's husband immediately filed for divorce and a restraining order against her, and he believes she was responsible for his son's disappearance. Karen's biological mother has also accused Terry of causing his disappearance and filed a lawsuit against her in 2012. In spite of these allegations, there is still no hard evidence to connect Terry with Karen's disappearance and he remains missing. That was five cases of students vanishing from their schools part two. I appreciate all the support you folks have given me since I started this channel, and again, I apologize for the lack of videos. Hopefully, coming up, I will be able to record the videos with my own voice and I can put this app to rest once and for all. So, stay tuned. Also, please if you would like, share and subscribe to the channel, I would be a happy guy.